Hello everyone. The title of this video is Completing the Square. So every example I'm going to be doing in this video is taken directly from a free online textbook at openstacks.org and I'm in their Algebra and Trigonometry text, section 2.5, Quadratic Equations. And I'm working under the objective heading, completing the square. All right, so each example in this video is either going to be an example from the reading or one of the try it problems from the reading or one of the exercises from the end of the section that is related to this particular objective. And I would ask that whenever I start a new example, you pause the video and try to work it out yourself first before watching me doing it and comparing. Because I feel that you should be practicing these things on your own as well, and not just watching me do them. All right, so the first example I have here, now what we're asked to do is we're asked to solve each quadratic equation by completing the square. And so first I want to talk about that. Right, what does it mean to complete the square? Right, so I'm going to do this on the right side of the page. Talk about completing the square. So suppose we have, or we're given, an expression with a quadratic term, you know, x squared, plus, and then a linear term. So say b, the number b, that's a number, times x. Right? So b is a real number. Right? So off to the side here, b is a real number. and x is the variable. So we have a quadratic term, x squared, and a linear term, bx. And one other, one other thing I want to point out about this is that the quadratic term, right, in order to be able to complete the square, for, what, for our purposes, uh, the quadratic term should have a, a coefficient of 1. So the quadratic term, the x squared term, must have a coefficient of 1. Okay, so 1x squared, and then plus, you know, bx. b is the coefficient of the linear term. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add something to this, add a constant, and try to create what's called a perfect square trinomial. Now, these may look familiar, oh, this might sound familiar to you. I have talked about perfect square trinomials in a previous video on, on factoring perfect square trinomials, if you've seen that or read about it in the in the OpenStax text. But we're trying to complete a square. We're trying to complete one of these perfect square trinomials, which look like the following. Hopefully this rings a bell. If I have something squared, right, a squared, plus or minus, but I'll stick with the plus here, 2 times that a times b, right, some other expression, cap, capital B, so try not to confuse little b and capital B, please, and then plus capital B squared, any expression of this form, right, any trinomial, three terms, any trinomial of this form is called a perfect square because when you factor it, you know, it's the same factor 
twice. It is a square, right? This, this a squared plus 2ab plus b squared is equivalent to the quantity a plus b, you know, to the second power, a perfect square. So if we take a look at our expression up here, I've got, let's think about it this way. I've got x squared plus, and then bx, just to get a 2 in there, I'm going to multiply this by 2 and also divide it by 2. All right, I'm going to multiply it by 2 and divide it by 2 and watch what happens. You have 2 times, and then remember, uh, x is going to act like a. All right, x is going to act like a in the perfect square trinomial formula. All right. So here I'll put x, and again, this second term here, I'm multiplying by 2 and then also dividing by 2. So now instead of b, I have b divided by 2. All right, so x likes acts like the a. And then this little b over 2 will act like the capital B. So that gives me a hint right, as to what needs to be added on to quote unquote, you know, complete the square, finish off this perfect square trinomial. All right, so what gets added on is this. I would add on b over 2, or half of b. All right, again, that replaces capital B here. And then squared, right? There's a b squared here. And once you do this, right, so again, this, this gets added on. And once this is added on to our quadratic and linear term, we have now a perfect square trinomial, right? Something of this form, you know, x squared plus 2ab, 2 times x times half of b, right? That was the bx. Then adding on this half of b squared gives me the exact same form as a perfect square trinomial, so I should be able to express it as a quantity squared. And remember, a is acting like x plus, and then the capital B was acting as, you know, b divided by 2, little b divided by 2. All right. So for example, all right, I'll do a swift example here. For example, if I was asked to complete the square on the following expression. Say I had again 1 1 x squared plus or minus, right? You know, what uh, the, the the linear term can have any coefficient you want. But let's just do a, a simple one here. How about plus 6x? Right. So 1x squared plus 6x. Right. So that, that lowercase b is 6. Right. So when I'm saying complete the square on this quadratic and linear term, that means you know let's add some number on to make a perfect square trinomial fit this form here. So according to this, what I'm going to add on, and I'll do it in a different color here, is half of b, right, so 6 divided by 2, or 6 times a half, whatever you want to say, squared. But that's 3 squared, that's 9, right? This is x squared plus 6x plus 9. And the addition of this 9 turns our x squared plus 6x, it turns it into a perfect square trinomial, right? You have, what you have done here is completed the perfect square trinomial, but in short, they're just saying, you know, complete the square. And because it's now, it's now in this form, it's in this, you know, perfect square trinomial form, I should be able to express it as a quantity to the second power, right, a, a square. And remember, x acts like the a plus, and then the, the capital B here is the 6 divided by 2, is the b divided by 2, right, which is plus 3. And you can check this out. 
take x plus 3 times x plus 3 and you would get x squared plus 6x x plus 9. So that's an, there's one swift example of completing the square. All right, again, so you have a quadratic term with a coefficient of 1, and then some linear term, bx. You add half of b squared on, and it will create a perfect square trinomial, which you can then re-express as x plus that half of b that quantity to the second power. All right, all right. So, how are we going to use this to solve a quadratic equation? All right, so let's keep that in mind. So now solving you know, a quadratic equation by completing the square, which is, you know, what they're asking us to do. So the first step is to get the equation in the following form. Where you have, you know, the quadratic term plus the linear term. And once again, you know, I'll, I'll say it again, the quadratic term has to have a coefficient of 1. And I will point that out one more time here. Coefficient of 1. This is very important. A coefficient of 1 on the quadratic term. So get your quadratic term with a coefficient of 1 on one side plus the linear term also on that same side equals you know, some number. Over here we have a number. Um, I'll just call it k, right, where k is a constant, right, there are no variables over here, right, a real number constant, all right, uh, then you complete the square. Complete the square. Um, now, don't forget it's an equation, though. Right, don't forget that you have an equation. What I mean by that is, you know, for completing the square, you're going to be adding something to one side. You know, this x squared plus bx, we're going to add, ha you know, that half of b squared. Right, we're going to add the half of b squared and then change it. But when you add the half of b squared to one side, you've know, you got to add it to the other side as well. All right, so let me start these steps off in example one. All right, I'm not done with the steps. but So here, you know, I've got x squared minus 3x minus 5 equals 0. So I'm going to get these, you know, get the quadratic term and linear term, isolate these, get these on their own side. So all I need to do is add 5. So we have x squared minus 3x. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave a little space for that number I'm going to be adding. And then equals, you know, positive 5, 0 plus 5. And all, uh, you know, the coefficient on the squared term is already 1. If it weren't 1, very easy to change it into 1, just divide everything by that co by that coefficient. You know, if this was 2x squared, I would just divide everything by 2. You know, if it was negative 5x squared, I would just divide everything by negative 5 to get that quadratic coefficient to be 1. So now comes the complete the square part. Right. So I'm going to add here, I'm going to add now, b in this case is negative 3. Right? Remember, the, that lowercase b is the coefficient of the linear term. So take negative 3 and then cut it in half. Right? So we're going to have a fraction here, but that's no big deal. You should be able to deal with fractions. And then square it. You add half of b squared. But don't forget, it is an equation. 
So if I'm adding this to the left side, I must also add it to the right side. All right, well, that's 9 fourths, right, when you square negative 3 halves. So we have x squared minus 3x plus, you know, 9 fourths, right, negative 3 halves squared would be positive 9 fourths equals, and then over here we have, you know, 5 plus 9 fourths, which I'll put together in a, in a, in a little bit here. Uh, I, I need a common denominator over here. Right? You can't you can't add or subtract numbers unless they have the same denominator. This is five over one, but it's easy to fix. Now the whole reason for completing the square, the whole reason for adding this negative three halves squared or adding this nine fourths, is to create a perfect square trinomial. Right, this left side now three terms is now a perfect square trinomial. It is in this form. You know, x squared plus 2 times x times half of b plus half of b squared. It's in this form. So I should be able to factor it. I should be able to express it as a square. So some quantity squared. And it's the variable, right? It's x in this case, right? x plus whatever half that b was half the b was negative 3 over 2, so it would be you know, plus negative 3 halves or minus 3 halves. Okay. Now I leave it to you to check that. All right, you can test this out. Take x minus 3 halves and multiply it by x minus 3 halves again. Do all the foiling and combining like terms. You'll see that this expression squared is x squared minus 3x plus 9 fourths, I promise you. All right, now on the other side, remember, you need a common denominator. And I'll do this over here. You know, 5 is 20 fourths. Right? 5 is the same as 20 over 4 plus 9 fourths. So, and then you keep, keep the common denominator. Right? When you add or subtract and get the same denominator, that's the denominator of the sum. And you just combine the numerators. So, 20 fourths plus 9 fourths is, you know, 29 fourths, all right? Cool. All right, so now I, I've done, the first two steps are done. I got my quadratic term and linear term on one side, a constant on the other. I made sure that the coefficient of the quadratic term was 1. Then I completed the square, and, you know, what I added to one side, I had to add to the other. All right, so now... Step three, now we have an equation for which we can apply the square root property. And this is something I've had in a previous video on using the square root property. Now I'll write it up again here, what the square root property is. That's, you know, if some expression is being squared and it's equal to a number all right, so again, k, k is just representing a constant here. Then this expression being squared is either the principal square root of the number or it's the opposite of the, squ of the negative square root. And so x equals either the, the principal square root of the number or the expression being squared is the opposite of that square root. Right. And then you solve these solve these resulting equations and check your solutions, right? So I guess step four, solve these, right? Solve these resulting equations that you end up here after using the square root property. And then of course the final step in any equation solving should be to check your solutions. And you always check, you know, back in the original equation just to verify that, you know, you truly do have a solution, that the statement is true. Okay, so now I'm going to be calling the square root property the SRP here. So you see I have this equation now is in this form. I got a variable expression squared equal to a constant, right? Uh, so by the square root property, right, by SRP, this expression being squared, 
right, x minus 3 halves is either the positive square root of 24 9, 29 fourths. Now the square root of 29 fourths we can rewrite using uh, the quotient property for radicals. This is the square root of 29, which doesn't simplify any further, divided by the square root of 4, which is just, you know, 2. All right. So I'm going to write it that way instead. So we have x minus 3 halves is either the positive square root of 29 fourths, which is the square root of 29, you know, all divided by 2 there, right? Just make sure the divided by 2 is not in the square root. Or the x minus 3 halves, right? The expression being squared is the opposite of this, right? Negative square root of 29 uh, divided by 2. And then I solve these for x, right? x is not alone yet. So one of these is, you know, in both of these equations, I'll just need to add 3 halves. And as a personal preference, I like putting, you know, non-radical terms before radical terms. It's just a personal preference. I mean, you could do this, you, you could write the square root of 29 divided by 2 and then plus 3 halves. Nothing wrong with that. I just like, again, I like putting non-radical terms before radical terms. Right? Non-roots before roots. So adding 3 halves gives me, you know, positive 3 halves, and then you have plus this square root of 29 divided by 2. Right, there's one possible solution. Or, here, same thing, adding 3 halves to both sides, you get positive 3 halves, and then minus the square root of 29 uh, divided by 2. And then check these. Right? Always check it back in the original equation. Now you can do it by hand if you want. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with that. Oh, and I guess another way you could express these solutions is the following. All right, another way you can express these solutions notice how, you know, 3 halves and the square root of 29 over 2, they have the same denominator. So we could say x equals, you know, just keep the common denominator when you're adding and combine the numerator. So 3 plus the square root of 29 divided by 2, that's one solution, all divided by 2. And the other one would be the same thing, but just with a minus. So I could put the minus right underneath the plus sign here. It's the same exact solution, but with a minus instead of a plus. So you might see this written very often. All right x equals, you know, 3 plus or minus the square root of 29 in the numerator, all divided by 2. Just remember that the plus or minus symbol means that there are two solutions, right? One with the plus, one with the minus. So you might see it written out that way as well. Now, again, I personally like writing them separately, <clears throat> like that. All right, now let's check it. All right, let's check them. Now, again, you could do it by hand. Right, if I want to check these, you know, if I were to check x equals, you know, 3 halves plus the square root of 29 divided by 2, uh, I plug them in, you know, plug it into the original equation, x squared, so I take 3 halves plus the square root of 29 divided by 2 and square this, and then minus 3 times it, right, minus 3 times the 3 halves minus, uh, plus the square root of 29 divided by 2, right, and then minus 5, and see if we get 0 back. All right, now I'm going to do this kind of real quickly here. All right. uh, this, when you square it, remember you have to foil and combine like terms, you'd have 9 fourths, right, 3 halves times 3 halves, then you'd have 3 root 29 over 4, but twice, right? So that'd be plus 3 times the square root of 29 over 2, right? It's over 4, but twice. And then here you'd have 29 fourths, right? Plus 29 fourths when you take that and multiply it by itself. Okay, so that's what I get when I square that. And I distribute the 3 here. We'd have minus uh, 9 halves minus 3 times the square root of 29 over 2 and then you have the minus 5, uh, and I'm seeing that the, the radical terms are going away. Right? you got positive 3 root 29 over 2, negative 3 root 29 over 2, those are gone. And then I'll just get a common denominator for everything else. 
<coughs> this is, uh, you know, these two make 38 fourths, which is really just 19 halves, right? That's 19 halves when I reduce it. Then minus 9 halves would be 10 halves, which is 5, and then minus 5 is 0. That works, all right? Sorry about all the clutter there. But this totally works, right? So yeah, but you see, it's kind of a pain <coughs> to check by hand. But this number is a solution, <coughs> right? 3 halves plus the square root of 29 divided by 2, that's a solution. And you could do the same thing with the other one, and I promise you it's going to work. I promise you. Right. <coughs> Plug it in and check it. Now, there is a another way you could check these, you know, with some technology. Right, and I have no problem with you guys check it, checking your answers with a calculator. You know, don't rely on a calculator to find answers for you. Uh, so what I have here is a uh, TI-84 plus emulator. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter one of these numbers. So let's enter the other one. I already checked, you know, the first one by hand. So I got three halves. You know, then minus the square root of 29 and get out of there and then put divided by 2. And I'm going to store this number. I'm going to hit the store button. I'm going to take this number and store it as x. Hit the variable button x. So now you'll see whenever I hit the letter x, whenever I hit the variable x button, it's this number. It's 3 halves minus the square root of 29 halves, right? negative 1.1925, blah, 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 blah. All right, so then going back to the original equation, I'm going to enter this left expression and this right expression. Now, the right expression doesn't have any variables. It's just 0, so I'm just going to need to enter the left expression and see if we get 0. All right, so I go x squared uh, minus 3x and then minus 5. And just remember that whenever I hit x here, it's this 3 halves minus the square root of 29 halves. And hopefully, I get 0. And look at that, I do. All right, so three, this 3 halves minus the square root of 29 halves, this is also a good solution to our equation. Right. So that's how I like checking with my calculator. Great. Yeah. And I'm going to follow the same steps for every single one of these. I get the quadratic term and linear term on one side. Make sure the quadratic term has a coefficient of 1. Then complete the square, right, adding something to both sides, and then writing the perfect square trinomial as a square, right, as this x plus b over 2 squared. Then use the square root property, solve, and check same things every single time. All right. So the next example, again, same thing. All right, so example two, we're asked to solve this quadratic equation. Now look, it's already in the form that I want to be able to complete the square. See the quadratic term and a linear term on their own side, constant on the other. And the lead coefficient is one. So now I can just jump into it and complete the square. All right, so we have x squared minus 6x. I'm going to leave some space for the number we're going to add equals 13. Now, the lowercase b here, right, the coefficient of the, of the linear term is negative 6. All right, so half of b, right, we're going to take half of b, that would be negative 3, and then you're going to square that, right? Half of b squared would be negative 3 squared, that would be positive 9, so 9. I'm going to be adding 9, and don't forget to do it to the other side as well, right? Add this half of b squared. Now, once you add the 9, right, this left side with the three terms should be a perfect square trinomial. And so I can express it as a quantity squared. 
and that quantity is going to be the variable x plus whatever half of b was, and that was negative 3. So this is this x squared minus 6x plus 9 is the quantity x minus 3 squared. And you can check that. Take x minus 3 times x minus 3. FOIL, combine like terms. You're going to get x squared minus 6x plus 9 back, I promise you. Equals, and then 13 plus 9 is, you know, 22. So now I have the equation in a form for which I can apply the square root property, right? I have a variable expression squared on its own side equal to a constant. Great, so by the SRP, right, by the square root property, this x minus 3, right, this expression that's being squared is either going to be the, the positive square root of 22, which doesn't simplify, or the opposite of that, right? x minus 3 would be negative square root of 22 as well, because that is also a number that when you square it, you get positive 22. And I'll take this over here. Now we solve these for x, right, by adding 3. So one solution is positive 3, you know, and then you have plus, the, you know, square root of 22, And the other possible solution I'm getting, again, is add 3 is positive 3 minus the square root of 22. And once again, if you like, you could write 3 plus or minus the square root of 22 since they look so similar. Just remember the plus or minus symbol implies that there are two solutions. Now let's check them. All right, so again, it's a little tedious to check, you know, these with, with radicals. Uh, by hand, you know, you plug in 3 plus the square root of 22 here and here and see if the left side is actually equal to 13. Uh, but I'm going to do this with technology. And I'm going to pull the calculator up again. And I'll just test that first one. All right, 3 plus the square root of 22. Okay, and then I'm going to store this number as x again, right? It doesn't matter what the variable is, I'll just call it x every time. All right, so now every time I hit the letter x on my calculator, it's this number. It's 7.6904, blah, 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 right? It's 3 plus the square root of 22. Then going back to the original equation, right, the expression on the left is x squared minus 6x. So I'm going to punch that in, x squared minus 6x, right? Remembering that x now represents 3 plus the square root of 22. And hopefully when I hit enter, this will be equal to 13, right? The other side is 13. And look at that, it is. So 3 plus the square root of 22 is indeed a solution. Wonderful. All right. And uh, the same thing would go, I promise you that the other one works as well. Okay, I know I did everything correctly here. All right, so again, you should check them though. You should be checking these, just like with any equation. Great. Okay, um, number three, okay, quadratic equation. All right, once again, we need to do some moving of some terms. You know, I want if I want to solve this by completing the square, we need to get the quadratic term and linear term alone. All right, so let's get these by themselves. The two x squared minus eight x. So I'm going to add five. So we have 2x squared minus 8x equals 5. I can't complete the square yet, though, because this is not 1, right? Remember, the lead coefficient, the coefficient on the quadratic term, needs to be 1 in order for us to complete the square. Well, that's easy enough to fix. Just divide both sides by whatever the coefficient is, which is 2 here. So I'm dividing both sides by 2. Remember, it's every single term. So this is x squared. Right now it has a coefficient of 1. Minus 4x. And now I can complete the square. So I'm going to leave some space for the number we're going to add. And then the other side is, you know, 5 halves doesn't reduce. Right? So 5 halves or 2.5. Right? And that lowercase b, right, you have x squared plus bx the lowercase b, you know, from my complete the square formula, is negative 4. 
Right, we take half of that, right, b over 2 would be negative 2, and then you square this number, right, which would be positive 4. So I'm going to be adding 4, and don't forget to do it to the other side. Now, the whole reason we add 4 is to complete the square, to complete a perfect square trinomial. So x squared minus 4x plus 4 should be able to be expressed as a square. And it's the variable, x, plus whatever that half b was, which was negative 2. So this x squared minus 4x plus 4 becomes, you know, the quantity x minus 2 squared. Equals, and then this is 5 halves plus 8 halves, right? 8 halves is 4. Get a common denominator. This is 13 halves, right? 13 halves. All right, and then I can apply that square root property now. Is I got a variable expression squared equal to a constant. Right? So now by the SRP, right, by the square root property, this x minus 2 is either you know positive square root of 13 halves, which usually you know people don't like. Fra you know, for some reason, it's been decided that you know we shouldn't have fractions inside radicals. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just they want us to rationalize denominators. You know, so this is the same thing as the square root of 13 divided by the square root of 2. And then we rationalize the denominator by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the square root of 2. So I'd have the square root of 26 in the numerator and just 2 in the denominator. Right? Rational. So we have x minus 2 equals you know, positive square root of 26 divided by 2. That's positive square root of 13 halves. Or x minus 2 equals, you know, negative this, right, negative square root of 26, uh, you know, divided by 2. And don't forget to make sure the divided by 2 here is not in the square root. All right, and then we're going to solve each of these. Right, I'm going to pull this up here. Sorry about the lack of room. And to solve both of these equations, I would just be adding 2 to both sides, right, plus 2 here, plus 2 here. So we get one solution is positive 2 plus that square root of 13 halves, which I rewrote as the square root of 26 divided by 2. There's one solution. And the other involves minus, right? x equals, again, this one you just add 2. You'd have positive 2 minus that square root of 26 divided by 2. And let's check them. All right, now this time, I'll, I'll do, again, I'm just going to check one of them with, with my calculator. All right, again, you can do it by hand, but that's a little bit tedious. Uh, I'm just going to check the one with the plus, right? You can check the one with the minus on your own. So I get 2 plus the square root of, now you can just put the square root of 13 halves, but I'll do what I wrote, right? Square root of 26, and then make sure you get out of the square root, and then put divided by 2, right? There's the square root of 26 divided by 2. And I'm going to store this number as x. Right? So na now, you know, whenever I hit x, it's that number, 4.549 something, right? The 2 plus the square root of 26 divided by 2. And we go to our original equation, right? And just, you know, enter expressions with variables with this variable x. The left side right, is 2x squared. 2x squared minus 8x minus 5, and hopefully, you know, I get 0. Right, the other side is 0. Now, this is due to calculator rounding. This is basic, this is 0. This e to the negative 12 thing, this means, you know, times 10 to the negative 12. So this is 1, and then you move the decimal place to the left, 12 places. So this number here means, and I'll write it on my paper, you know, 1 e negative 12 means 0 0.00000000001. You know, I took 1, moved the decimal place to the left 12 places. That's what the e minus 12 means. That's 0. Okay, it's it's zero. It's just it comes up that way because of the way you know computers round. It's not perfect. 
but it is zero in my opinion. So we have a good solution. All right, and you can do the same thing with two minus uh, the square root of 26 divided by two and see that you get something that's basically zero, it would round to zero, right? and it works from the original equation. Wonderful. Okay, good. So I'll box those in. Right. There's one solution, there's the other. And again, if you want to consolidate things, you can write 2 plus or minus this square root of 13 halves or the square root of 26 divided by 2. Great. So let's do some more. I just got one more page here. It's the same procedure, though, same steps for this, you know, solving by completing the square. All right, so the first step, remember, was to get the quadratic term and linear term on their own side. So I'm going to add one-third. So we have x squared plus two-thirds x. And then, you know, the, the coefficient on x squared is one. So I can complete the square here right now. So I'm going to leave some space for that number we're going to be adding. And uh, earlier I added one-third, right? So there's one-third on the other side. All right, so the lowercase b here, the the coefficient of the linear term is positive two-thirds. Half of this would be positive one-third. And then squared, right, half of b squared would be one-ninth. So this is the number that's getting added to both sides, one-ninth. I'm adding one-ninth here, adding one-ninth here. All right, don't forget it's an equation. Now remember, the whole reason that we are adding this one-ninth to the left side and right side, but to the left side especially, is to create a perfect square trinomial, right, completing a square. So this x squared plus two-thirds x plus one-ninth, that should be able to be expressed as a square. And then what squared? Well, it's going to be the variable x plus whatever that half of b was, which is one-third. So x plus one-third to the second power is x squared plus two-thirds x plus one-ninth. And I leave it to you to check that. And then if I get a common denominator over here, this would be three-ninths plus one-ninth. That's four-ninths. Right. Three over nine is one-third plus one-ninth. That's four-ninths. Now I can apply that square root property, right? I have a variable expression squared equal to a constant. Right, so by the SRP, right, by the square root property, this x plus one-third is either equal to the, the positive square root of four-ninths. Now the square root of four-ninths, though, that's two-thirds. So it's either positive two-thirds or negative two-thirds, right? x plus one-third equals negative two-thirds. And then I just solve both of these. Uh, solve them for x. And again, I'm going to bring it over here due to my lack of room. I apologize. But for both of these equations, I would simply be subtracting one-third. So for this first one, we have x equals, you know, two-third minus one-third is one-third. That's one possible solution. Or negative two-thirds minus one-third would be negative three-thirds, which is negative one. And then don't forget to check these. Now these are actually a lot easier to check, you know, being that they don't have a radical term, they don't have a square root. Uh, these would be easier to check out loud. You know, when x is one-third, uh, you get one-ninth plus two-ninths, that's three-ninths, which is one-third minus one-third is indeed zero. So one-third works. And then negative 1, you'd have 1, which is 3 thirds, minus 2 thirds, because right, x is negative 1. Uh, 3 thirds minus 2 thirds is 1 third, and 1 third minus 1 third is 0. Both, both of these work. Excellent. So I box them in. Okay, same steps every time, right? And, and you can solve you know, any quadratic equation using this method, as we have seen so far. All right, now this last one, you know, 
oh no, the variable's not x anymore. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the variable's called. It's still a quadratic equation, right? Because the highest power on your variable is the second power. Right? And there are, are no variables and denominators and whatnot, right? It's a polynomial equation. So I'm going to follow the same steps and we'll just end up with p equals instead of x equals. And you know, when I check it on the calculator, I'll call it x again, but no difference, no major difference. So again, the first step is I want to get the quadratic term and the linear term on their own side. So I'm going to keep the 6p squared plus the 7p over here, and then take away this negative 20. We're going to add 20, right? So that'll be positive 20 over here. All right, now the coefficient on the quadratic term is not 1, it is 6. So that's an easy fix, right? We just divide both sides by 6. And that'll turn the lead coefficient into 1. All right, 6p squared divided by 6, that's p squared, plus, and then 7 sixths, right, times p to the first, right? There's your co there's your linear term. And now I have a coefficient of 1 on the quadratic term. I can complete the square. So I will leave some space here for the number that we're going to be adding. Equals and then 26 reduces to 10 thirds. Right? They have a common factor of 2. Great. Alright, so now the, that lowercase b, that you know, that linear coefficient is positive 7 sixths Right, half of this, right, just multiply the numerator by 1, the denominator by 2, that's how you take a half, would be 7 twelfths. Right? That's half of 7, seven sixths. And then you're squaring this number. Right? So take, ha take that half of b and square it, that would be 49 over 144. Forty-nine one forty-fourths. That's the number. It sounds funky, but that is the number that will be added to both sides. Okay. Now, the whole reason we add this number right, is to create a perfect square trinomial. This p squared plus seven sixths p plus forty-nine one forty-fourths this should be able to be expressed as a square where you have the variable, you know, it's p this time, plus, you know, whatever half that linear coefficient was, which was 7 twelfths, right, plus 7 twelfths. And you can check it, you know, take p plus 7 twelfths and multiply it by p plus 7 twelfths again and FOIL and combine like terms, you will end up with p squared plus 7 six p plus 49 one forty fourths. All right, now this one I'll actually write out. Um, you know, the least common denominator would be 144. You know, 3 does go into 144 evenly. In fact, it goes into it 48 times. All right, 48 times. Uh, yeah, that'd be 120 plus 24. Yeah. So I multiply these by 48. Four, so that'd be 480. This would be 480 over 144. Right, this is 10 thirds, because this is 3 times 48, that's 10 times 48, plus, and then 49, 1 44th, okay, great, and then 48 plus 49 would be 529. So this is 529 144 on the right side after getting a common denominator and adding. Wonderful. Now, take you know, the square root property. Right, I've got a variable expression squared equal to uh, a, a constant. All right, so now I can apply the square root property. And by the square root property, this expression, this p plus 7 twelfths, is either the positive square root of 529 over 144, now I know the square root of 144 is 12, right? So the denominator will be 12. 
and the square root of 529 I believe is 23 yeah 23 squared 23 times 23 yes that'd be 520 yeah that's, that's 23 beautiful that's a nice nice perfect square there uh, so p plus 7 twelfths equals 23 twelfths or negative 23 twelfths, right? P plus 7 twelfths equals, you know, negative 23 twelfths because, you know, negative 23 twelfths squared is also 529 hundred fourths. All right, then I solve each of these for P by just subtracting 7 twelfths from both sides. So the first possible solution is 23 twelfths minus 7 twelfths uh, 23 minus 7 be 16. That'd be 16 twelfths, but that's you know 8 6. That's 4 thirds. 1 and 1 third. Or then this one, the second equation, take a negative 23 twelfths minus 7 twelfths. That'd be negative 30 twelfths. Right? Negative 30 twelfths. Be negative fifteen sixths, which would be negative five halves. Right. Negative five halves, right, or negative two and a half. And then check them. All right. So again, these don't have square roots in them, so it'd be a little, probably easier to you know do out loud. You know, so like four thirds, you know, six times sixteen ninths would be ninety-six ninths plus twenty-eight thirds. Change that to ninths. I don't know. You could do it by hand. I'm just gonna punch in the calculator, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't feel like doing that mentally and I don't feel like writing it out either. I mean, you could write it out, but it's gonna take four thirds, right? My first solution. We'll store it as, I'll use x instead of p, and just remember x represents p here. And then the expression on the left side is 6p squared, so 6x squared, plus 7p, right, so plus 7x, and then minus 20, and hopefully I get 0 or something that would round to 0. Right. Ah, fantastic. And then I leave it to you, you can do the same thing with negative 5 halves, right, but negative 5 halves should also work in that original equation. So p equals 4 thirds, p equals negative 5 halves, wonderful. Great. Right, notice, you know, for any quadratic equation, I was doing the same thing every time here. You, know, you get the quadratic term and linear term to their own side and a constant on the other. You then make sure that the coefficient on the quadratic term is 1 Right, by some simple division if you need to. Then complete the square. Right, make sure to add the same thing to both sides. And then you know write that perfect square trinomial as a square. Then you apply the square root property. Solve for your variable. Check your solutions. Right, just, it, was, it was the same thing every single time. Yeah, it's a lot of steps. Maybe a lot to remember. But it was the same thing every time. So you should be able to tackle any quadratic equation this way. And we'll eventually come across some scenarios where we'll have imaginary numbers in our solutions. You know, so far, for all five of these examples, when I was using the square root property, right, I had a square equal to a positive number. Right here it was a square equals the four ninths. Here it was a square equals, you know, positive five hundred twenty nine hundred forty fourths. But if you ever have a square equal to a negative number, then you'll, your solutions will end up having an imaginary part to them, right? You'll have that i involved, because remember the square roots of negatives are imaginary. So just keep that in mind. That'll come up in a future video, I promise you. Wonderful. All right, so I'm hoping that watching me go through these five examples here help you in some way when you're asked to solve an equation, a quadratic equation, by completing the square on your own. And thank you very much for watching.